Hi everyone, so I'm Rashad. Um, thank you for joining today. I wanna to thank all our judges, our startups and our attendees. For this competition, um, these are the, this is the final pitches. The agenda for today is I'll give a brief introduction followed by a fireside chat with Amit. Then we'll get into pitches and we'll do closing remarks. I'll start with an introduction about who I am and what is Health Tech Investors. So I'm a family physician by training. Three years after finishing medical school and residency, I was working as an attending and I was lacking purpose and meaning at work. There's a big uh, arrival fallacy in medicine where you're said that once you become attending, you will be successful and you will be happy. I found success and happiness are different things. They're not the same thing. And at, at that point of my life, I was lacking happiness at work. I was successful objectively, but I didn't have meaning. I have a rebellious nature by default. So the startup world appealed to me. The big ideas, working on bold problems, changing the world, it's something that I was naturally attracted to. The way I look at the framework of how to change the world, there's two ways you can go about it. Either you can build a movement, you can build following, you can invest a lot of capital, almost like a coup model, or, and in that method, you're not accepting the world as it, you're rejecting the world as it exists and trying to change it. The second method I find is you accept the world as it is, you accept the financial incentives that exist, you accept the way things run and you try and make incremental and somewhat disruptive changes. That is a more tactful model and that's the model I find venture capital and in research investing and startups follow. So I started my startup journey, I want to say in 2019, COVID gets uh, timelines muddled, but towards the end of 2019, I had the idea of automating certain clinical decision support tools and automating certain consoles as travel medicine. I started Clinic Up, I grew it to about 11, 11 physicians, a full team of 14, five psychiatrists, uh, five family doctors. We saw about 1,100 patients. It didn't work out, lots of lessons learned in that journey. And I talk about this in a video I made, uh, some of the biggest lessons are, and I've discussed this with some of the founders on the call here is I, we really look for commitment to the startup and to each other early on. Um, after I closed my startup, I wanted to stay involved in the investing space and the entrepreneurship space, but I wasn't ready for another startup. So I thought I'll do the easier thing. I'll back people doing the hard thing, which is making the companies. I'll be the capital and the guidance behind them. I looked into what it means to be a good investor. And essentially it comes down to three things from my perspective and Harry Stebbings talk, talks about this as well. It's about deal flow, diligence and value add. Success for me is not, and this, this may sound strange, but success for me is not returning capital or making money. It's doing those three things well. It's doing deal flow well, it's doing diligence well, and adding value to my startups after I invest in them. This was born more out of necessity than out of uh, wishful thinking, some may call it. Um, after I finished med school, medical school, I didn't match into residency. It took me four years, about a thousand outreaches. Um, I had six interviews and ended up matching after my fourth year. Throughout this time period, I worked really hard to redefine what it means to be successful. And it was having those outreaches, seeing how successful I am in getting feedback back and getting meetings, getting observerships, getting research opportunities, um, and just iterating on that process. And taking that to my investment philosophy now and to health tech investors investment philosophy, success is to reiterate uh, deal flow, diligence, and value add. Um, Adam Grant talks about this, reward the process, not the outcome. If you reward the outcome, you will create perverse incentives to reach the outcome. The best way to understand this, if you reward a strict BMI, people will starve themselves. They will not exercise and eat healthy. And we see this in value-based care where there's an overemphasis in uh, outcomes and not the process, which leads to the outcomes and overemphasis in reducing readmission rates, not factoring in things like sickle cell, but inherently have higher readmission rates. Um, and medicine outcomes are based largely on socioeconomic status. It creates incentives where health systems will pick populations with a lower SES status. Um, I don't want this to be a, more about value-based care, so I'll come back to investing. Um, so after I closed my startup, I started investing um, in startups in the healthcare space. I think being an industry expert, 
and having intuition around if the end goal for the startup is will physicians use this, I can get to that answer fairly quickly, especially if they're in the market in the next six months or if they're market five years beyond, it's a little bit difficult. Um, so I said, I'll stick to healthcare, I'll stick within my circle of competence. I made three investments last year. A lot of physicians around me um, wanted to invest as well, but they didn't know how. They didn't know how to do deal, how to get good deal flow. They didn't know how to do good diligence, how to balance structure and intuition and diligence, and how to add value to startups after. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaking a little bit more about diligence, uh, the way I look at it is you use structure initially, and then you use intuition after. Usually, I will always invest with intuition. I have invested against my intuition, and my intuition was correct, and that's very painful. So I'm not going to do that again. Uh, but I'm happy to invest with my intuition and be wrong and refine my intuition that way. Uh, some of these questions I'll, I'll ask Amit as well and get his thoughts on. So I made three investments last year. I saw this opportunity for physicians wanting to invest with me. I said, okay, I'll teach you guys. I launched a Facebook group to teach physicians how to invest. And all this time, I'm a big believer in brand and design. Um, I think branding is everything in the future. I think we have to put ourselves out there and people seem to resonate. Uh, personally, when, I, when I'm just honest and transparent with, with what I'm doing, what I'm thinking and what my intentions are. Um, so I started teaching physicians on this Facebook group. It ballooned to 500 physicians in about two weeks. I've capped it at, at that for now, um, but I'm slowly working through the waiting list. I asked them what they wanted to do. They said they wanted to invest with me at a small check size. As a founder, I knew um, that founders don't want to talk to 30 angels and get 5,000 each. Um, the diligence process and the process is just not a smooth process. I'm like, okay, we'll invest all together under an SPV. Focusing again on deal flow diligence value add, I'll say, let's focus on deal flow. Uh, let, let's make this about branding, about design. Uh, let's provide a platform for our startups to display them as well. I've grown my LinkedIn at this point to about three to 5,000 impressions a day, um, so 150,000 a month. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll use this platform. I'll, I'll, I'll promote the startups on this platform. And by doing that, I'm hoping I get deal flow. Um, I, I think I was right. I got 76 healthcare startups, some amazing founders working on some difficult and some of our most difficult problems in healthcare. We, a lot of our startups that applied were already uh, backed by venture, which isn't um, everything, but it, it, is a, it is a signal. And I think investing is partly about looking for signals after you invest to see if you did it right or not. Um, so after the 76 hours applied, what we said, okay, how do we pick? How do we pick the top 10? How do we pick the top three? How do we pick the, the winner? The initial screening criteria was based on uh, a, a lot about the founding team. What is their founder market fit? Is their founder problem fit? In medicine, and this may sound funny, investing, it's, it's well known that industry experts and insiders generally do not disrupt and innovate. Um, it's outsiders. But in healthcare, for some reason, we, we hang on this idea that's insiders that will innovate and disrupt. I think industry expertise is important. Uh, but some outsider entrepreneurial perspective is important. So what we look for is that entrepreneurial DNA in insiders. The very small subsect of uh, scientists um, and physicians who have that DNA. Um, and uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Ahmed his thoughts on this as well, because it's, it's, it's it is a bit of a tension between the more time you spend in medicine, the more time you spend as an academic, the more you want to protect the status quo, because you, you, there's the big sunken fallacy there. I said, okay, we'll, we'll have this criteria. The biggest reasons why startups succeed, um, if you ask uh, second-time founders, they'll say distribution. If they ask first-time founders, they'll say what their product is. There's a study by Idea Lab, and they looked at, which was a, a more of a venture studio model. They looked at thousands of startups. They said, why now? Our market timing is the biggest predictor of success. This is complete opposite to public equity investing, um, time in market beats. Timing the market, and for those of you listening, I know there's a lot of physicians um, who are watching this. Um, there's, there's not many parallels you can draw between the public markets and the private markets. Um, so we said, okay, let's, let's see what market tailwinds we are banking on. We did our market research and we identified four. We said AI to not clinical decision support. I don't think the liability and reimbursement structure is there, but automating workflows in healthcare, streamlining workflows, and also AI for patient engagement. 
I think there is a big market that's missed in the patient activation model. Uh, Frisia coined this term a while ago. One of our startups, Data Icona, is is working on this. Um, have g- providing patients more knowledge um, to take charge of their own decision making is something we're banking on quite a bit of health tech investors. Um, the other tailwinds are a digital front door hybrid home care model and epigenetics and precision medicine, um, which are two separate things, um, is, is an, are two other tailwinds. So we're looking at startups who fit this uh, model of market tailwinds we're banking on. We thought about the something I'm thinking about right now is portfolio construction. A lot of angels don't think about portfolio construction. I think it's a mistake. Uh, we're thinking about the cadence, amplitude, and frequency of our investment. Um, and this goes back to, do you want to be a generalist investor or a specialist investor? There's a slow decline of the generalist investor in general. Uh, people are looking for more niche investors. There is tension, I find, between this concept and the power law. Uh, the power law of investing says a small subset of your startups will bring most of your returns. But we see a lot of investors say, I'm only going to invest in 10 to 20 companies. I'll take a big ownership stake and I will drive this company to success. Most people will say investing is a game of picking winners, not making winners. But the the venture studio model and the new model kind of argues against this to an extent. And this could be just markets are changing and the new environment is different. Um, so I'll kind of pause there. And Amit, are you, um, are you have you been in traffic yet? Yes, I have actually. They were doing construction literally in front of my home. I spent 10 minutes to do like 0.1 mile, but I am home. Let me just turn on my camera. So um, do you want to do my segment first, uh, Rashad? Yeah, so the the um, idea was for us to do the chat first and then we'll get into uh, the pitches and then I'll do uh, some closing remarks. Sounds good. I am opening my computer here. If the, Note to self, for those who live in California, don't drive. California is always under construction. It's kind of like Toronto, I guess. Yeah, yeah, under construction and under traffic. If the audience has questions, you can ask them. Um, but we'll wait for Amit. Um, sure. My computer is turning. I mean, I can show the video here on my screen. That's okay. I think uh, Amit Mehta, do you want to give a brief intro and then Shi Wei and then Sharon and Rick, and then we'll we'll get into the fireside chat. Sure. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is also Amit. Um, my background is at the sort of intersection, uh, trying to draw my, draw my sort of Venn diagram as the intersection of uh, three sort of spheres of influence. One, I'm a physician by training. I'm an interventional radiologist. Um, trained at Mass General in the Harvard system and ran um, a lab running computer applications in medicine there and uh, launched a few sort of products out of out of that Harvard ecosystem about 20, 25 years ago. As part of that journey, um, had a few patents and inventions and was investing in companies and realized that investing was something that I was interested in. And so sort of tra- started transitioning into investing and, and VC um, along the paths started a company in the clinical trial space in 2008 and sold that to a public uh, two years ago now. Um, so had its influence as an operator in the clinical trial space and started as a venture partner in a fund called Formation 8. And then over the last 10 years, have matriculated into a general partner at a fund um, called Builders uh, VC. We're on our um, second fund. So it was about a billion, a billion and a half um, AUM across four funds with uh, investments typically to healthcare, um, ag tech, construction tech, prop tech, internet, and then you know some things like synthetic bio and some of the other things. I lead pretty much the healthcare practice. And so our second fund is 250 million and we're about to raise a $400 million fund. So our investments are typically seed and A kind of investments. Um, did start a, a couple of angel networks in Texas where I live, and so have been involved very early on in pre-seed and seed from that perspective as well um, across other disciplines than healthcare. Thank you, Amit. Um, Shu, where you want to go next? 
Sure. Um, so my name is Xie. I'm uh, the managing partner at Popal Bio. Um, it's a new fund started in 2022, and we're very much focused on the biotech space. And we have investment in both the the public side, uh, the public investing, also the private investing. Uh, for full disclosure, Inherent is one of our first uh, investments. So, <laughs> and yeah, Christian. Um, so, so my personal background, I, I, I have a background in clinical research and clinical development, I work in um, a startup, you know, leading to a public company, Acera Pharma, really working on the, uh, you know, clinical trial design operation. And um, I get Rishia talk about from the physician perspective, but from, from the clinical research perspective, you know, there's actually a lot to be, you know, there's lots of innovation you could do to actually move the program much more efficiently, much faster, if you can understand the end goal, you know, what physicians want, what patients want, what payers want. And ultimately, everyone wants the same thing. They want better outcome. They want better life for the patient who are, you know, suffering from the debilitating condition. So what we found, you know, from my experience is like lots of the, especially the small companies, you know, are kind of under the pressure from, you know, what the experience should be, you know, what's the expectation, the phase one, two, three, the standard practice. You know, there's actually a, a suppression of innovation for, especially for younger startup, when you're under lots of pressure from the fund, you know, the funding, um, the, the, the people who supply your funding. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of like how I decided to join on the venture side, you know, um, it wasn't a natural choice for me, you know, having been my whole career in research, um, but um, it, it, it has been a fun journey so far. Thank you for that, uh, Xi Wei. Sharon, do you want to go next? Yeah, hey, Rashad, really great uh, to meet everyone. And thank you so much for Rashad for organizing this. Really happy to be on the call and see familiar faces and also non-familiar faces as well. Worked with Amit actually at Tal Ventures. We're an AI first fund investing in early stage healthcare AI and enterprise AI. Um, to give a little background on myself, academically trained in computer science, specialized in AI, and then um, also did a master's in epidemiology. Did my tour of kind of biotech and healthcare tech, worked at Novartis, and decided that I wanted to be a software engineer, but then ultimately pivoted into investing. And so now out here, based in New York, um, continuing medical training. But really great to meet everyone, and for everyone in the audience, too, great to meet. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, and last but not, certainly not least, Rick. Hi, everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Toronto, uh, born and based. I run a venture capital fund with my partner, Daniel Kraft, who's out in Silicon Valley, called Continuum Health Ventures. Uh, we're seed through a uh, digital health, health technology, and um, longevity biology focus. Um, we closed, we did our first closing of our fund in uh, fourth quarter of 2021. Um, we've made about five deployments, actually six as of today. Um, and excited um, to learn more about everybody today in the uh, pitch competition. Um, prior to this, I was uh, angel investing. Um, I had a startup that I launched in 2012 um, in the big data predictive health analytics space that exited to IQVIA. Um, prior to that, I was an analyst and a consultant for the global device and pharma space. Um, and um, sort of started my chops in acad academia at the University of Toronto, um, studying human bio and pharmacology and did graduate work in um, studied uh, zinc, zinc finger transcription factors. Um, um, so yeah, so super excited to meet more people here today and uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Awesome, thanks. Um, Amit, uh, do you want to give a brief intro and then we'll I have three sure. questions for you, uh, but they're all three part questions. So sure, sure. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Rashad, thanks for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to meet all of you. Recognize a lot of the faces. Amit Mehta and I are co-invested in our Pedro.bio. Rick Mehra and I are invested in uh, Biosha. And Sharon and I, Sharon puts up with me all the, all the time <laughs> since we work together. Um, and I've gotten to know a little bit of the Canadian MD Mafia, courtesy of Rashad. He runs a great podcast. So I'm just putting it out here. I would love to get free healthcare. Uh, please, I'm here in the U.S. I... I, I don't want to put myself through U.S. healthcare. 
Um, but that's what I focus on. I um, do healthcare AI investments. Our fund overall is an AI first fund. We just closed our second fund. Uh, we haven't announced it really, but uh, today we are at 85 million total. Uh, we are doing seed investments primarily, writing checks of more like 500K, can be a little higher, a little bit lower. Uh, our other partner does enterprise. It's about 50 deals that we have done in four years uh, across of our three vehicles. We have three vehicles right now. And uh, I'm an operator turned founder turned investor. I started my career at Google. This was too long ago, pre-IPO days. I'm not going to share my age here. Um, and uh, worked there as a product manager. Um, went to business school, came back, joined venture capital, worked at a big fund called Norvis Ventures, worked at a different, another fund more focused on early stage called Samsung Next Ventures. In between, started a company called Health IQ uh, that ended up raising a lot of money. It's public if you guys want to look it up. Got to Series D. Um, and I, academically, I trained to be a doctor, but decided not to go. So um, I hear you and what you're saying, Rashad. Uh, I had my own reasons also, but I uh, almost went down that road, uh, ended up leaving with a master's in medicine, uh, health AI, essentially. Perfect. Thanks, Amit. Um, so we'll, we'll get into questions. Something I'm kind of thinking about quite a bit with myself and sharing with my angels as well is portfolio construction. And specifically, whether we should take a generals versus specialist approach, whether we should diversify into 50 to 100 startups or be a more constrained approach, 10 to 20 startups. How do you think of the power law and how do you think it comes into play with the new rise of specialist VCs with a constrained portfolio of 10 to 20 startups? Um, does the power law not apply anymore? Is it more catered towards generalist? Um, I'm currently reading the book, The Power Law by Sebastian Malvi, book I recommend to everyone. Um, but I would love to get your thoughts on portfolio construction, power law, equity versus control when thinking about this. Sure. Uh, I assume that's a question for me, um, but I just want to throw it out here. Amit and the other Amit and, and Rick also will have great perspectives as we'll share. And so, if at some point you guys want to chime in, I will cede my space here. But love for to hear and learn from you guys also. Uh, actually, Shui, probably you also have some perspectives as an investor. I just don't know you as well, but I don't want to volunteer unduly. Uh, I can tell you how we do it at Tao. Um, so we like to invest in the teens, um, so 12 to 18 in terms of valuation at the seed. Um, can be a little higher, can be a little lower, but 80% of our investments are there because 500K gets us just about you know, close to 5% ownership. And the 5% ownership, at least from our perspective as investors, is kind of the threshold to get parada rights. So think about me as a small investor. I want to make sure if a company is taking off that I can continue following that journey. Um, if you are a large fund and you see a company that's doing well, you get some sharp elbows. You, you want to take as much of the round and, and not leave much room for other VCs. So for us, it's really important to get pariah. That's where all of this comes from. Um, let's get enough ownership to get to a place where we can continue following the journey. And then the number of investments is really a function of time. Um, realistically, any good VC can maybe manage 10 companies, 10 boards, anything more than that, you're spread too thin and you can't do much justice to your portfolio companies. There is a rhyme and reason to do more than that. Um, there is certainly a place for a strategy, which some people call spray and pray. Um, I, maybe there's other words here that are more appropriate, but uh, we don't follow that strategy. We are more of a concentrated portfolio strategy. And it is because we want to be close to our entrepreneurs. So hence the specialized fund that you're mentioning, Rashad, um, a, a, small, a good small fund these days will end up doing 20 to 25 deals for the life of the fund. And another thing for an entrepreneur to remember is that when a fund says they have 85 million, it's not like they have 85 million today. They have 85 million for the duration of the fund. At any given moment, they might have 10 million out of that available to them. Um, it's dependent on the cadence that they call capital. And most funds will leave reserves. So in our case, we leave 50% in reserves because we want to be able to add more money as the company raises an A, a B, or a C. So for the entrepreneurs here, for the doctors who are aspiring entrepreneurs, what I would encourage is, you don't need to know all of these answers. However, you should know the questions. When you talk to a VC, you can ask these questions to try to understand how they operate and what you can expect to when you work with them. Um, Rishad, I think to going to a question in terms of 
the evolution, emergence of specialized funds, it's really a function of maturity of ecosystem. The more specialized, the more mature an ecosystem is, the more specialized VCs will get. So here in Silicon Valley, at least where I'm sitting, we live in the age of specialization. There are generalist funds. They, some of them will continue being very successful. By and large, those uh, generalist funds are very large funds uh, that have lots of capital, that have very established brands, because then you're signing up with the fund more so than even perhaps their specific expertise, right? You know that that fund has a good brand because of their history. Um, I think Canada is, I dare say, going through that evolution, as are many other markets. If you look at China, India, Brazil, all of those are going through that evolution where specialized funds are emerging, and I do expect that to continue. Okay, perfect. Um, the chat was supposed to be just you, Amit, but if you want, I can oh, open it up okay. to everyone. Um, uh, I'm happy to do however you see fit. I think let, let's just stick with you in the interest of time, because I, I know everyone here is very insightful and I would love to pick everyone's brains. Um, but in the interest of time, let's just stick with me and you um, for this one. How do you think of venture in terms of, is it a game of picking winners or making them? Uh, it's a bit of both. Uh, I would like to think that VCs do add value. The, right, the good VCs do add value. Um, I think there's a lot of VCs that don't, to be frank. Um, and I'm speaking as the perspective of a founder turned VC. So uh, I think picking the right partner, uh, the right person to work with is more important than even the terms that you get or the firm that you work with. Um, I do think a good VC is worth his or her weight in gold uh, because they can help you find just the right hire, give you the right inside, open up some doors to a customer, bring on a new investor, um, help you with an acquisition. Uh, there are so many case studies around this. Um, just to pick a very high profile example, LinkedIn got acquired by Microsoft. And if you read behind the scenes, Reid Hoffman kind of architected that. Uh, it's been written a lot. Uh, so anybody who's curious can look it up. And Reid was uh, doing this uh, partly in his capacity as founder and partly in his capacity as an investor at Greylock. So um, he kind of played both sides here. But I do think that's an example of a VC who added a lot of value. Um, that's the part of nurturing a company. Um, and the other part is picking. And for us, at least at Tao, uh, we look at the aptitude of the founder. So it's not your credentials. It's not your experience. It's your aptitude. Credentials are a signal towards your aptitude, but it's not a perfect signal. Experience is a signal, but it's not a perfect signal. We do have entrepreneurs who are first-time entrepreneurs fresh out of college. We also have entrepreneurs who have done five companies before. Um, the, I think the key for, for us, and I dare say for most VCs, is you look at the fine balance between, I believe I can make this work despite the odds. At the same time, I also have the humility to know what I don't know, listen to others, and be able to change direction. So McKinsey has a framework, level five leadership. It's kind of like being able to hold the paradox in your head that, yes, I can, but no, I can't, right? Like, yes, I can do this. I can build the parachute while I'm falling through the abyss but I may also need the help and I'm willing to get the help when I need it. I'm really happy you said, I'm really happy to hear you saying that you do back first time founders. There are very few founders who have two unicorns under their belt, but we seem to still have somewhat of a bias towards previous successful exits. It looks like a previous small exit is arguably um, a better measure of success. What do you look for and founder problem fit and founder market fit? Do you value founder market fit or do you feel like with enough founder problem fit, they will learn about the market, they will learn about market tailwinds and what is driving sales in the current market dynamics? Um, the data shows overwhelmingly that past is not a predictor of the future. Um, there's certainly a bias, unconscious or perhaps conscious uh, in the ecosystem. But I think first round had a study, they analyzed like everything about their companies, um, age of founder, experience of founder, how many founders, sector, what year, et cetera. They couldn't come up with a single correlation for success other than a single one, which was that the partnership disagreed at the time of investment. Uh, the best success is when it was right at the edge. Maybe it could succeed, maybe it couldn't. If it's too obvious, it may be too late or it may not make sense. And if it's too much to the negative, then it's probably too early or it doesn't make sense, right? So it's right at the edge when it is just plausible. 
Um, and when it is just plausible, obviously in a group of smart people, you'll have disagreements. Um, so I, I think debate is a very healthy thing for, I think all the investors in, in this room will agree that uh, consensus, not unanimity is the way to make a decision. Um, so that, that, that's what I would advocate Rashad is uh, for a founder also, it, it, it plays the same equation. So going to a question around product market fit and what to do, most founders have another co-founder. Uh, there are solo founders out there. By the way, we have back solo founders. Uh, one of our portfolio companies is a 14X for us and it's a solo founder. So once again, for every norm, there is an exception. And I say norm, not rule. Uh, rule is set in stone. Norm is just a good practice. Um, there are no laws or rules in entrepreneurship by definition, there are norms. Um, and for, for a founder, they should listen to their core team and to their investors. Like, how do we get from zero to one in the case of doing a seed? And then eventually from one to a hundred, which is series A's, B's and C's. Uh, I like to say the framework is a pre-seed is a PowerPoint, a seed is a prototype, a late seed is a uh, pipeline of customers, a series A is a product market fit and a series B is your business model taking off. It's not the amount of money you raise, it's what you use the money for within this framework. So at different stages of this framework, you also ask different questions. And your question, Rashad, I think fits in very well with the seed stage. How do you get product market fit? Well, you test out your ideas, you get a pipeline of customers. And in some cases, you should be willing to scrap away your idea completely and iterate. In some cases, you should actually try to break through the wall. It's hard to say exactly what should be done in every single case. The key thing that should be is the healthy debate, both internally within the company and with the key stakeholders of the company. I love that answer. And this is something I think new investors struggle with so much. They look for certainty and they look for product market fit. And this is something I um, am discussing quite a bit with the physicians involved with this pitch competition. There's about 35 of them um, where they're, they're, they're looking for certainty. They're looking for 100 percent surety. Um, and as you said, that's a marker of either it's too late um, or we're more likely we're missing something. And we have that certainty because we haven't dug deep enough. Yeah, um, Rashad, if I may interject, uh, I, I appreciate the mindset um, because in, I, as a quasi-failed doctor here, uh, married to a not-failed doctor, um, it, the, med the mindset in medicine is let's do something once we're absolutely sure it won't fail, right? It's people's lives at stake here. Let's do that operation. Let's put that injection. Let's do something here once we know that the risk has been min minimized. I think for a startup, it's the opposite mindset. Let us do something because it could succeed. We, we know it could fail. 99% of the chance it will fail, right? But let's actually do it because it might succeed and let's figure out how to do that. Um, Thomas Edison had that quote, right? Like I didn't invent the light bulb. I invented 99 ways of failing and I discovered the one that did not right? So yeah. I'm paraphrasing his quote here. Um, a lot of our startups, especially at the early stage is that. It's quick iteration, quick testing, figuring out what works and then doubling down on that. Once you figure out what is working, go all in, like yeah. 101%. Yeah, that, that's really well said. And I think for from a motivation perspective, define your success as a speed of iteration early on. Don't define it as product market fit. You, your goal is product market fit. But if that's your goal, every day you don't achieve it, will be looked at as a failure and it will be hard to stay motivated. Um, and as a previous founder, I... That switch in mindset was very powerful for me. Um, I'll ask one last uh, question, Amit. Um, I think I have to ask you a question about AI in healthcare. Um, so I'll, I'll doing AI before it became a buzzword. That's my yeah. humble defense here. Do not shoot me. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of focus on AI as a clinical decision support tool. Um, and, and I know Ahmed Mehta has some very insightful and intelligent thoughts on this as well. Um, and if, if I could, I, I would want to hear your thoughts on this one in particular, Ahmed, as well. Um, but uh, Ahmed Garg, I'd love your thoughts on specifically clinical decision support tools in AI. And then the second where I found your views fascinating in our last competition was in drug discovery. Um, but uh, feel free to talk about whatever else you're most excited about when it comes to AI and healthcare, what particular use case or vertical? Um, sure, sure. Well, I think the group that we have here is a 
hyperpower group. Um, a lot of what I will say is already been said or read. So let me offer a story here. Um, since I'm speaking to a bunch of doctors, um, about 200 years ago, we had another innovation um, in Europe, actually, at the time. And um, it allowed doctors to quantify something about your body. And uh, a lot of people resisted and they said, no, no, no. Why do I need to put numbers? Why do I need to like do this? I should just be able to touch the patient and figure this out. And it makes no sense to do this. It took about 50 years for that innovation to get adopted fully. Uh, today, we would laugh at it because we call that innovation the thermometer, right? Like putting a number on a patient. So that was a single dimension around temperature. Um, AI is a tool that's multidimensional. Uh, that allows you to do things much faster at a much bigger scale. Uh, I call it a, a multidimensional Swiss knife for a, for a physician. Um, it, I do believe very much that it allows us to do better differential diagnosis, better tri triage, uh, pay attention to better signals from noise ratio. Uh, we're flooded with data as a society. And um, just to give one data point here that will resonate a lot with the doctors, at least the studies I've read, everything you learn in med school is 50% of it is outdated by the time you leave med school. That's how fast things are evolving. There's no single human being can, that can keep all in their head, uh, straight in their head. I think AI gives you the possibility to take away a lot of that mental burden, take away a lot of the, those mistakes for us to really focus on what matters, which is delivering care, technology in the service of humanity. Like let's actually provide the best possible treatments for everyone. And, and Rishad, I think you know a little bit of the other side of my life, you know, the nonprofit that I have, I, I do believe that it, it should be a little bit like the model at Canada, like let's provide at least a level of dignity and healthcare and education for everyone. Um, so I, I, I do see what we do here at Venture and as startups, a, a, a step in that direction. It's not a complete step, but a good step. Um, and, and let me punt it to Amit Mehta since, since you volunteered him. Uh, and we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear his thoughts too. Great name, by the way. Yeah, I mean, um, if you could uh, also comment on, is the oh, market- Oh, you want to talk about drug discovery now? Uh, no, Amit Mehta, sorry. sorry. Oh, Amit Mehta, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we have to think of different names, maybe. Um, I have to go by guard. Um, Amit Mehta, if you could comment on, is the market ready for clinical decision support to AIs? And if so, who, who is ready to pay for them? Um, but I'd love for your comment in general on AI and healthcare as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a conversation that we've had before, and and as someone you know who looks at AI probably different than Amit Garg in terms of there's lots of places that AI can play in healthcare, right? And healthcare being a very heterogeneous investment cycle in terms of there's drug discovery, there's drug deployment, there's development, there's clinical, there's you know, and all of these things. But you know, again, to, to Amit's point in in telling a story, you know, I'm a radiologist, right? And the folks who are in Canada, George Hinton just left Google. The first person who said the first person, the first people who are going to be out of a job are radiologists. And as I've looked at the evolution of AI in imaging, it's been an interesting journey, right? Version 1.0 of AI, and we use this term very loosely, but was just pattern recognition. It was CAD, computer-aided diagnosis. And it was just finding things on an image. And it had no further uh, um, benefit than just highlighting something on an image that a radiologist or someone would be looking at, and it had made no assessment of what that abnormality was. And over time, that has progressed, but it has not actually progressed that much. I mean, the AI is still not able to synthesize a significant amount of clinical information with an imaging finding to get to probably what I would call AI or CAD 2.0. So while it's great to look at that, and you can look at a whole host of a cemetery of venture-backed imaging companies in AI that have raised a good amount of money and have all gone to zero, because of the primary problem with a lot of this technology is that there isn't someone to pay for it, right? And there's three people in the in the healthcare system on the clinical delivery side. Now let's put drug discovery and all of that on, on a, in a different category. This is pure clinical delivery. There's patients, there's payers, and there's providers, right? And I, I, Canada's a little different. And I grew up in Toronto, so and I worked in the Canadian system, so I'm actually very familiar with the Canadian system. And then I've been in the U.S despite whether you're in Canada or US for the for the constituents in this audience, patients don't want to pay for anything, me included. I mean, I pay for insurance, I have a deductible and I don't want, I'm not, I don't really want to pay out of pocket for anything more than that. And we have primary experience in that, you know, there was mammography for women 
underwent an evolution about seven to eight years ago where there was a movement from 2D to 3D. And the payers decided not to cover 3D mammography and only 2D. And 3D mammography is much, much better than 2D. So we were charging as a practice $50 out of pocket and nobody wanted to pay it, despite the numbers being significantly better and evidence-based medicine that 3D mammography was significantly better. No one would pay for it. So the patients are out, the providers pretty much out. Providers are seeing reimbursement cuts. You know, Canada's a little different than the U.S. in terms of the compensation mechanism, but I, I think you can ask any physician, no one's seen a reimbursement hike in anything that they do in the last 25 years. I mean, each year we get ratcheted down by CMS on our reimbursement. And the providers don't really want to pay for anything if it doesn't benefit them. So if there's a decision, a clinical decision support tool that makes doctors better, makes you more efficient, helps you with burnout, that's great, but you as the physician pay for that. We don't want to help you as a payer to the physician. So the problem that we've seen in a lot of this stuff is that it's great to develop a lot of this technology, but if you don't have a true monetization strategy with who the person, who the entity, who the um, the promoter is who's going to pay for this technology, you're going to you end up in this graveyard of AI technology of which, you know, imaging was the first one where we saw a lot of it, but I think it's making its way through the remainder of, of clinical medicine. So is, is someone ready to pay for clinical decision support tools? Or I, I think there are use cases, and, and I think Amit Garg sees a lot of these companies where, and we see a lot of the similar companies, that there is, there is a way where if you can show efficiency or changes in the system that you can, that a payer can monetize or a provider at the level of an institutional, uh, you know, a large institutional provider, you know, as we, we saw last week that, you know, Humana's dropped, is now moving into an MA only plan and 50% of sort of Medicare constituents are now on MA plans. There is in a capitated system, an opportunity to demonstrate cost savings with technology. And so given that that is now becoming more pervasive in the U.S., if you can demonstrate a cost savings, I think there is opportunity. But part of the issue there in the venture cycle, you know, when for all of us who have funds, you know, we have three-year windows where we're investing into and then harvest for several years. The, the time cycle for demonstrating efficacy or efficiency in cost savings can be much longer than that. And to prove that out to a payer can take a long time. So you, you need to be with investors who will be with you for a long time. Awesome. Thanks, Amit. Richard, if I can just add, what Amit Mehta is, is using is the, the, I call it the 5P framework, patients, yeah. providers, um, pharma, uh, the one, another one that can pay for things. And um, uh, what's the one that you, you also Payers. Payers and, and the one that I would highlight is politicians. Um, so uh, do not underestimate the role of the government. Um, so th there are other actors like self-insured employers. Uh, we increasingly see that as a go-to-market. And I agree with Amit, the other Amit, uh, nobody wants to pay. Even though healthcare is so important to us, we're just, at least in the US, just fed up with paying for insurance and not getting healthcare um, appropriately. So the amount of dollars that are transacted most of it, 90% of it, it's actually B2B. Uh, the 10% that's direct by consumers is mostly deductibles, mostly co-pays. It's not really people paying for healthcare. So anybody who starts a company that's more B2C, we tell them, look, 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 that's great. If you're doing wellness, people will perhaps pay for it. But if you're doing truly healthcare, you can maybe get started, gather more data, hack your way into getting a contract with the payer or provider, but the B2C is a gateway towards it. Yeah, and, I, and this isn't meant to be a deterrent to anyone who's doing AI or using it. This is just, you have to understand how to play this game, right? It's naive. I mean, I, I look at a lot of companies where the first thing we ask them is, in, it, especially in the medical device space, right? I mean, what's your CPT code or what's the IC? And they, oh, we'll figure out reimbursement later. Well, yeah, if you're going to try to figure out reimbursement later, we're not the right investor for you because I've been through that track, you know, with medical devices that I've invented and Getting a code is very, very difficult. And we can't get paid by the government for procedures we do now that have evidence-based medicine and work. Vertebroplasty, sacroplasty are examples. We can't get paid for those and they work, let alone novel technologies that someone's trying to get a CPT code for. So I think just as entrepreneurs, you just need to have an understanding of what's out there and what you need to do to be successful. It's not don't do it. It's figure out the way to get it done. 
Yeah, I think the the time frame is very important for founders to understand. And some businesses may and will change the world, but they're not. They might not fit the venture model, and that's okay. Um, they might fit the pharma model. They, there's with the r- rise of corporate ventures. Um, you know, there might be other models they might fit. Um, but I think it, the time cycle is important. Uh, and the let let's get to the pitches. I think Andy and Kristen, you're first. Great. Yes. Yeah, let me share my screen, make sure everybody can see it. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Yes. Great. I'm Andy Olson, co-founder and CEO of Inherent Biosciences. And we are redefining the path to parenthood by raising the standard of care in reproductive health. Before co-founding Inherent, I spent 20 years commercializing new technologies in molecular diagnostics. And I'm really excited to introduce you to my co-founder, Kristen. Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Brogard. I'm co-founder with Andy and Chief Scientific Officer. Uh, my background is in epigenetic sciences um, and also have a previous experience in venture-backed uh, company founding. Excited to be here and excited to answer your questions at the end about the science and the technology platform. So this picture shows all of the syringes for a single patient fertility journey. And you can see in this little onesie, worth every shot, hashtag IVF baby. The average fertility journey is two years, about $80,000 on average. And there's 65% of patients that drop out of treatment The number one reason is the emotional toll. And tragically, there's three times more divorces. We started looking into this challenge in fertility because I had some friends going through fertility treatment. They'd been trying to get pregnant, not surprisingly, for over two years. They had spent $80,000 mostly out of pocket, and their physician had diagnosed them with unexplained infertility. And that's what caught my attention. I was like, why is it unexplained, and how often does this happen? And it's been reported by the WHO that one in six people suffer from infertility. It's projected to be a $50 billion market globally by the year 2030. And there's a lot of burden on the female partner. She gets extensive and invasive testing and treatment. And yet up to 50% of infertility is due to male factors. And the current standard of care is like sixth grade science. It's taking a microscope to count the number of sperm and how many of them are swimming. So we've developed a proprietary sperm quality test. And this picture shows our at-home semen collection kit. We send it to the patient, the patient collects the specimen in the privacy of their own home, and then sends it into our laboratory for analysis. This is a physician ordered test. If you have 100 patients coming into the clinic for fertility care, the proprietary sperm quality test that we've developed under this brand that we also have started called Path Fertility, it um, identifies 20 men that go undiagnosed with the standard workup. And when men go undiagnosed, women are put through treatment that will not work. This report example shows you the report that we provide to physicians, and it classifies sperm quality into three categories, excellent, normal or poor. And the physician uses this information to counsel the patients and provide treatment recommendations to what what would be best treatment to achieve a pregnancy and a live birth of a baby at the lowest cost and the shortest amount of time. So this chart shows the percentage live birth rate per cycle of treatment for the main the two main treatments which are IUI and the light blue bar there, that IUI stands for intrauterine insemination. And then the dark blue bar is IVF with ICSI. ICSI stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. This is where a highly trained technician takes one egg and injects one sperm into the egg, essentially doing the job of the sperm for it. And if you look at our results, so if we, have, if we identify a, a gentleman with poor sperm quality, the success rate of a live birth and having a baby uh, with his partner is significantly lower than going to IVF with ICSI. And you might say, well, why doesn't everybody just do IVF with ICSI for everything? 
And the reason why is it's the most invasive procedure and it's also 10 times more expensive than IUI. So why now? There's some great tailwinds in the market for this opportunity. People are waiting longer to have the children. And so they're increasingly freezing their eggs and their sperm to preserve their fertility. And we have new technology in the field of epigenetics to apply to this. Epi is a prefix that means above or on top of, and then genetics is the DNA sequence. So we look at what's on the DNA that's turning on and off gene expression, and that can be predictive of outcome there. So how we break down the market, there's 7 million couples in, in the US experiencing infertility. It's a 1.4 billion total addressable market. About half go to their OB gynecologist, and then 1.5 million are referred to a fertility specialist. And today, only about 500,000 are treated. So there's a tremendous growth opportunity in this market. Our go-to-market, we developed the test. And then this last year, we've done significant market validation I'm excited to tell you about. And so now we're into the early market commercialization. We've got early adopters that are starting to use the test based on our retrospective data. And based on market feedback, we've learned that we need to do a prospective observational clinical trial, which we've already kicked off, and that that will give us the clinical evidence to get inclusion into the clinical guideline. And that when that happens, we'll have access to and be able to gain traction in the majority of the market. And this sperm quality test is not the only thing that we have in our pipeline. We have a robust pipeline of R&D with a 10 billion US total addressable market. And I'll tell you more about our pipeline in a few slides. The way we look at the competitive landscape is most of the companies have focused on the egg and the embryo and doing genetic testing on those. So pre-implantation genetic testing, whereas we're focused on the sperm, the male side of the equation and leveraging this emerging technology and epigenetics. We have significant and strong IP protection in this area with two issued patents. 11 pending patents, and then we have broad protection and claims in this area. The fertility journey looks like this. This is a schematic that gives you the overall uh, perspective of a fertility journey. The dark line is what usually happens, and the dotted line is what occasionally happens. So occasionally a patient will go to their family practice physician or the primary care physician, and then end up getting referred to a fertility specialist. Most of the time, the female partner goes to her OB gynecologist and then starts down this journey. And you can see the significant dropout that occurs primarily due to that emotional toll. Where we fit in is we're starting in our beachhead market with this reproductive endocrinologist or the fertility specialist and that diagnostic testing, identifying if there's a male factor that is not captured by the standard workup. And that can guide treatment to this IVF or ICSI which gives them a higher um, likelihood of success when there's a male factor. And it's the standard of care. When there's a male factor that's diagnosed, IVF with ICSI is the standard of care, avoiding all of this dropout. The growth market is going then from the reproductive endocrinologist to the OB gynecologist and going up market. And then eventually we could go to a direct to consumer model with some channel partners. So our market validation to date, we have 20 fertility clinics, 50 physicians, and we've seen 10X growth over 10 months of utilizing this test. So that's really given us encouragement that we're starting to get to some level of product market fit and we should be investing and in doubling down on this, like Ahmet said. How we make money, our retail list price, which is a value-based price on avoiding unnecessary treatment is $845. We're currently charging patients directly for an out-of-pocket cash pay price of 385. And then at scale, we'll get COGS below $100 with a healthy gross margin. And I mentioned our pipeline. So we have three programs, fertility, offspring health, and then male cancers. All of these related to a semen sample that we're assessing uh, the epigenetics in that semen sample, either sperm or cell-free DNA. And so our first product, Sperm QT, each of these icons represents a milestone and a value inflection point point for the company. And we've already hit a couple of those. And then we're into this clinical trial. Um, NOA guide stands for non-obstructive azospermia. This is a condition where there's no sperm in the semen. It's 1% of all the population of men. 
10 to 15% of men seeking fertility care. The procedure for this is called a testicular sperm extraction. So these men are referred to a reproductive urologist. They fillet open the testicle and search for sperm. It's a very invasive procedure, as you can imagine. And it's also out of pocket, high expense. Half the time they can't find any sperm. We can predict the presence of sperm in the testicle based on cell-free DNA in the seminal plasma. And so we're really excited about our pipeline and the milestones that will hit. The funding that we're raising right now gets us into 2025 and all of these inflection points for the company. And this is just a quick view of our financials. We anticipate significant uptake after we get added to the clinical guideline and crossing over into profitability as a company in 2026. And here's a great comparable for this. So exact sciences, you've probably seen the ColoGuard test for colon cancer. When that was added to the American Cancer Society guideline, that's when you saw the hockey stick growth and the clinical adoption of that test in the, in the, uh, in the market. Here's our team. I mentioned my previous experience. So I've led commercialization in both large enterprises and biotech startups. Largest was Roche Diagnostics, and then five biotech startups, and I've gone through four exits with those. And then Kristen mentioned her previous experience with a VC-backed VC startup called Aravale, and then her PhD and scientific expertise in the field of epigenetics. And then we've assembled a team of talented operators, technicians, and clinicians in this space to execute on this opportunity. We're raising $5 million. We have $3 million closed and committed. Our lead investor is Propel Bio. We're very grateful for them. And then previously, we raised $1.5 million in both dilutive and non-dilutive funding. You can see our use of funds and the milestones that we'll achieve in hitting our primary endpoint on our prospective clinical trial this year, a U.S. commercial launch, either with a channel partner that we're already negotiating with a strategic partner on right now, or we also have modeled doing it with a team that we build, and then that ultimate inclusion into the guideline in 2025. So we'd love to have you join us, our team of inherent pioneers as we pioneer epigenetic medicine starting in reproductive health. We'll pause there and happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Andy, thank you, thank you very much to you and Kristen for sharing. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, very crisp and clear presentation. Uh, you've certainly practiced this. Uh, okay. Curious to understand more about the competitive landscape. Uh, I'm not an expert in fertility like you guys, but my sense is that there is a whole bunch of companies out there. Um, and different methods, different technologies. We do have a dearth of fertility specialists, at least in the US, but I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more about, is there a threat of some, some other company trying to do what you guys do? Yeah, so there's, um, I actually have an, an additional slide that I'd be happy to share about the competitive landscape. And uh, you know, there's been a few companies that have tried to do something in this space that provides better performance or impact to the, the patient's fertility journey, and then it's, it's easy and convenient for patients to get uh, tested. So we're in this area of molecular epigenetics. The main thing that people are doing and all major clinical labs, and now there's direct-to-consumer options, is, is really a standard semen analysis. So it's looking at the sperm, how many are there, how many can swim, and do they look normal? And we know, and it's been well-published and it's well accepted in the clinical uh, market that it's a poor predictor of fertility potential unless there's no sperm. Obviously, if there's no sperm, that azospermia that I mentioned, then um, you know it's it's uh, that's clearly an issue. And you can see the kind of the pricing, the average pricing around that. There's a couple of companies that have come onto the market with some with alternative technologies that attempt to address this performance of impacting the fertility journey. All of them require live sperm to do the analysis. It's very inconvenient for people to get this sample sent in. Um, capacitation is the ability of the sperm to penetrate the egg. And so it's one function that the sperm has to be able to do. And this company has been around for a little while doing a, a cap score. Um, you can see the cost there and it hasn't had significant uptake in the market. Um, and then DNA fragmentation has been around for a couple of decades. This is looking at breaks in the 
single or double stranded DNA. And it's, um, it's in the clinical guideline. It's not recommended for initial evaluation of a male patient. It's recommended when there's recurring pregnancy loss. And the treatment is to then take sperm like from the testicle because there's less DNA fragmentation. So it's, it's expensive. It's, uh, it doesn't have a huge impact. It's not recommended again. And it's been around for about 20, 20 years. And then aneuploidy is, is the, the correct number of chromosomes in the sperm. And it's not used a lot because you have to kill the sperm to, to use it. And so, you know, it's, it's around, but again, it's for primarily if there's recurring pregnancy loss for it. Andy, I have one question for you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, your pro forma is somewhat predicated and you use Cologuard as an example. You know, Cologuard yeah. is something that is insurance reimbursed and why they have hockey stick growth, except for the 20 states where IVF is partially covered. It seems to me that IVF will continue and probably for a very long time will be cash pay out of pocket of which we just had a discussion how no one wants to pay any for, you know, I had to, ch I just did the Cologuard and the guy said, you can pay for it out of pocket. And I was like, yeah, unless insurance covers it. I'm not doing any of it. So how, yeah. how do you get hockey stick growth on a product that is going to be cash-based probably for the foreseeable future? Yeah, great question, Amit. And, and there's payers in the market. So today, 31% of companies with 500 plus employees are providing some level of fertility benefits. And they're primarily administering this out of these, these groups. So progeny, uh, carrot, and wind fertility. Uh, so there's 63% that still have no coverage, really, like they're paying at mostly out of pocket. But one of our big initiatives is to get coverage from these groups for this testing. They're in, interested in it because it will avoid these cycles that they're paying for of like IUI that's not working. And also these, you know, dissatisfied employees that are going through this process. And especially if the physician's saying it's unexplained infertility and they don't know what's going on. So a big effort on our part is in addition to getting into the guideline, that same clinical evidence from our clinical trial will help us get coverage from these payers and, and assist in that. And we're doing that in parallel to get that hockey stick growth when we get into the guideline and we also have it paid for, because you're exactly right. I mean, we're hearing that today that patients are like, I have to pay out of pocket for this. Can I get it covered by my insurance? Is it covered by progeny? We're, we're already getting those questions. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, just a quick question. So we, we are starting to see a little bit more both in femtech and in mentech, um, uh, a lot more sampling being done at the home and, and mailed in. So when you think about the epi sequencing that you're doing, um, are you are you able to do this? Does this only have to happen in the clinic? I think I caught that at the beginning. I wasn't sure. Or is, no. can this be a mail, mail from home test? No. Yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump in on that. So we have done temperature and time sensitive testing on this product, and we can do an at home collection. So we, we can ship a kit directly to the patient's home, or we can collect it off of a semen analysis sample that's already happened in the lab. So the, the man is only required to do one collection. Um, met DNA methylation, which we're, which we're focused on, is extremely stable. It's a covalent bond on the backbone of an extremely stable structure. Um, and we have found no degradation at 10 days at 65 degrees Celsius. So we feel very confident and which actually makes the shipping much easier for um, just two day USPS shipping in you know, ambient temperature. So you can take sample that was initially done for traditional semen analysis and you can do the methylation analysis on top of that. So have you thought about just working with the existing companies that are just yeah. doing traditional semen analysis and offering yeah. a secondary offering for them because presumably they have patients who may not have gotten the insights that they were looking for on their first go on the test and might pay a small premium to get the additional insight. Yeah, you you nailed it. So in our market validation, which we did last year, that was really the number one request. Can we sync this to a current semen analysis? So we've developed what's called an aliquot kit that sits in the clinic's lab that we work with. And then also in the direct to consumer or other at home collection groups that are working, that are out there, we are in conversations to sync it with their, their semen analysis. Yeah. I think there's a Canadian company called Fellow that's doing pretty well right now. Yeah, Again, tradition, yeah. traditional semen analysis plus cryo preservation plus, I don't know, yeah. a couple of other yeah. offerings. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Just, 
Uh, just to hop off of Amit, uh, who was talking about the, kind of the business line, I, I wanted to kind of ask a question. Can you help me understand how you're reaching the payers and and targeting specific payers instead of like the larger kind of payer systems? Yeah, so we've been going primarily through the providers that we're working with, and they're the ones that are saying to the payer, will you get this on your you know, formula? Will you get this covered so that my patients can get it covered? or don't have to pay out of pocket for it. So that's primarily how we've been going about it is through the providers that are using the test and then getting introductions to people on, on the, the payer side and that they're also saying to the payer, will you please get this covered? And so that's been the, the approach that we've been taking there. Anything you wanna to add to that, Kristen? I would, I would just wanna comment the, the motivation in the fertility clinic and by fertility patients is significant compared to what I've seen in my past experiences in the wellness and preventive care market. So the 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 likelihood of patients paying out of pocket I've seen is just has been uh, there's been a lot less resistance than what I've experienced in um, more uh, surveillance and uh, pro proactive healthcare. So I, there is there is a huge motivation even in the self pay market for fertility. Jiwei, do you have anything to add? Well, I have lots of positive things to, to add. I think one thing is uh, particularly exciting about Inherent, and, and Andy said it in the closing remark, I don't know if you catch that, is epigenetic realized first by its firm analysis. So really, I think epigenetic is such a big, exciting field, right? And there's so much potential to it. But I think what Inherent is doing really well is to pick this first validation in a very realistic way it has a very clear proof of concept, proof of you know the 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 platform, uh, and the long term potential is 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 there are lots of more opportunities out there, um, but the first you know what you pick as the first validation I think matters a lot you know for for the long term of, of the company. Perfect. Thanks, Yue, and thanks, Andy and Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Tim, um, you're next. Awesome. Thanks, Rajat. Uh, Chris and Andy, that's super exciting. I said, uh, except the button, yes. Let me pull this up. All right. Can everyone see? Yeah. Got a thumbs up. Good. Hey, everybody. I'm Tim Fitzpatrick. I'm co founder and CEO here at Icona. And Icona is a company that's developed a VR learning platform that helps patients understand and transition to new treatment options. And we're starting with dialysis in particular. We developed Icona to help patients develop the knowledge, skills, and confidence that they need to make informed decisions about their care and their treatment options. And so that they can actually pursue those treatment options successfully. So simply put, we like to say we make care decisions a reality. We make better care decisions a reality. And Today, there are three problems that I want to touch on that I think are important to address. The first is why focus on patients, the second being why kidney care as a starting point, and then finally, the one we get asked the most, why virtual reality? So let's start with why patients. In 2013, I started my personal journey in the VA system. I was in the Navy at the time, and when I entered the system for my first surgery, I didn't realize it would be an 18-month uh, journey in the hospital. So three surgeries, 300, actually closer to 400 Wound, wound care treatments later, um, I finally healed and was able to get out of the service and move on with my life. Thankfully, I ended up in uh, sector trading, covering emerging technologies out on the sales side in New York. And I was covering public investments in emerging tech areas like AR, VR, and AI. And it was around that time that I met my two eventual co-founders, two neurosurgeons. One had been a VR filmmaker prior to med school. And they had just wrapped up this fascinating RCT in Dartmouth and essentially the idea was, how do we help patients understand their treatment using virtual reality to tell a story, to captivate the patient ahead of the day of surgery, to reduce some of that, that mystique and, and get the anxiety, anxiety levels down. And sure enough, when I first saw that the first time, I knew immediately it was something that I needed to work on. So we decided to think about what, what was the larger challenge present here. And of course, low health literacy, when I think back to my patient experience, which continues to this day, it's that inability to really understand, find, and apply health information, important health information to make decisions about my day-to-day -day care. 
And that impacts a wide swath of the US public. That's more than a third of Americans. And in particular, one of the first lessons we learned about 12 months after launching the company was there was one particular area where this was hardest hit. And it was, you might've guessed in kidney care. Kidney care today, uh, now in 2023, a lot of people are realizing this because of some of the macro tailwinds that exist in the space. But one fifth of Medicare, if you're not familiar, is spent on kidney care. And that includes that's dialysis, but also kidney disease and managing CKD at the earlier stages. But specifically in dialysis, where we're starting to focus, only about 12% of patients are dialyzing at home today, even though the benefits from a health economic standpoint, from a patient outcome standpoint, uh, and from a mortality and access to transplantation stand standpoint, those are all favorable if patients choose home. And it's actually less expensive. So it's better for everyone, but still we have not seen the rate of home dialysis increasing. And it's for that reason that a few years ago, uh, the largest catalyst in this space took place. We saw a shift of legislation through an executive order that essentially mandated the target aim of the number of patients who shall be at home or receiving a transplant in 2025. So the entire industry has, the last several years, we've seen the rise of value-based care, is moving towards this goal. But even still, with all of these catalysts and tailwinds, we're still seeing providers challenge when it comes to helping patients transition. And the barriers that we hear time and time again are related to low awareness among patients and frontline staff about options like home dialysis, and also fears getting over that hurdle to help them actually pursue that treatment. So we developed and we also went through the phase one NSF program and it was fantastic for discovery and um, has helped us find those industry partners like Fresenius and Next Stage who have allowed us to understand the patient viewpoint and develop what has become our novel framework for applying uh, clinical indication and learning tasks to delivery methods for learning tools. And what we've seen in this first VR use case, this first VR commercial product is increases in home adoption. So that is the number of patients who are deciding to pursue home therapies and ultimately uh, following through successfully on that pathway, as well as re average reductions, 41% of anxiety. And today we've served more than 250 clinics, uh, including the top industry leaders in this space. So to highlight a, a bit more on the traction piece, 250 clinics commercialized as of last year, uh, started in South Carolina with a proof of concept with NSF phase one, and then ultimately they, they turned that into a contract. Since then we've added four new states, four U.S. markets, and we're excited about figuring out implementation, expanding within states, and to, to, to basically determining what is the right uh, next step as far as adding new states and clinics and determining that strategy. Excitingly, the next phase beyond Dallas practices, we know that uh, nephrology practices who are seeing these patients before they decide on modalities, those that is where we need to make sure we have these solutions where patients are learning about and deciding before they even get to dialysis, can I start at home? Can I get access to a preemptive transplant? So our early partners in that space just to represent tens of thousands of patients and uh, a massive opportunity for us to really put our solutions, existing solutions in these brick and mortar centers where we know they can have immediate impact. And then because of seeing uh, in Q1, we announced this, our, our most recent partners with Fresenius, our pipeline is now increasing and that includes dialysis, CKD, and we're starting to see demand for new indications. And I'll get into that commercial pipeline in a second. So the partnership I mentioned in Q1 is with Fresenius, the global dialysis leader, uh, exciting partnership with them. We've loved working with them the last few years. They own 35% of the US market and about 30, a like amount globally. So just over 2,600 clinics across the US, specifically in Mississippi where this uh, press release took place is, uh, they highlight 7,500 patients on dialysis as well as 137 dialysis clinics across the state. And the really exciting thing about this program, this partnership between Fresenius and Icona is that it's focused on access in rural communities and underserved areas of the United States. So when we think about where COVID had disproportionate impact, where health literacy has a disproportionate impact, where staffing issues are very difficult to overcome, we can now serve those communities and help them find treatment options like home dialysis so that they can still get access to great treatments that improve outcomes and quality of life. And then importantly, we still have a long way to go. So even with this single partnership, uh, we still have an opportunity to serve more than 95% of those clinics across the country and hopefully across the globe. At Fresenius, decision makers are incredibly excited. They've been involved from day one. Uh, 
Dean as an example is someone who runs a program who it's called the Kidney Care Advocates Program, and they've been wonderful to work with. They are the frontline educators, right? They are the solution, the staffing solution where patients and advocates, care partners are going to meet patients and practices. They're going into homes, they're going into hospitals where patients are crashing onto dialysis and learning that their kidneys no longer work. We are that front line and now giving them access to tools that help them have those conversations. And then Jenna reached out, we've never met, she's in Georgia. She said, I cannot wait to have access to these tools in our clinics with our patients in Georgia. Now, this is part of a much larger challenge and that challenge is the amount of care that's shifting into the homes. We know the hospital at home and investment in complex services is the future. A recent report I'm highlighting here from McKinsey showed that up to a quarter of traditional healthcare spend that's in outpatient traditional centers is expected to shift to home. And it lays out some of the value pools where we, where we expect that is to happen, where there are already existing capabilities. So we're going after one of many opportunities to help patients transition into home therapies. And we know that we're going to play a critical role in that. So as we think about the size of these markets, uh, initially kidney care, if we think about annual license plus usage-based fees, just in dialysis clinics, we see a 100 120 million dollar a year market just with our existing kind of partner set and where we're, where we're focusing the product. But we know that's by no means where the only place the product can, can operate, the platform is adaptable. And in fact, we plan to start increasing beyond the adjacent markets. Let's say, what are the greatest causes of kidney failure? We know it's diabetes, we know it's hypertension, and we also have demand from some of those higher uh, complexity diseases, like I mentioned, that are shifting home and where if we send a headset home, we can do, provide support that is more capable of training and education and frees up some of those very expensive aspects of training that currently take place. Great, taking a look at our publications to date, uh, our team, its founding was highly scientific from academia, from medicine. Um, so we continue to publish on our frameworks and what makes us tick and why we see it. There, there is a, a applicable neurobiological framework to selecting the right delivery mechanism. Um, it also gets back to why we don't rely. We're not a VR company. We're a learning science company. So we are not taking VR and finding every problem. We're determining what is the best solution. And the first product happens to be VR. And you can see we continue to write and publish in leading journals in our industry, but as well as uh, where we expect the future of learning and healthcare to take place. All right, quickly on the roadmap here, because I know I just hinted at the market slide, uh, just to, to give you a sense of where we are on our pipeline of tools. Now, these are learning tools at various stages of development for different indications, uh, not all virtual reality. We are excited about continuing our research from NSF. We know that there's opportunities in the insights layer beyond the devices themselves that we get really excited about and thinking about things like modality selection and candidacy, which we know is a struggle in supporting clinical decision support. I was great to see that conversation before pitches kicked off. And then things like risk assessment. We know that value-based care is on the rise and what better way to help understand where your multidisciplinary care team services and cost can come down than to know what patients are actually understanding about the care you're delivering and the access to those services. Our team is fantastic, uh, obviously heavily biased, but we have uh, research, academic, clinical expertise. Just to highlight a couple, uh, Todd is our learning scientist. He himself has over 220 publications and 16,000 citations. Um, he is a forefront leader in learning science. So the neurobiology of learning ran his own lab in Texas for 30 years before coming to the private sector and joining me. Uh, he understands why the brain learns, how it learns, how it's not the best to learn. Jen ran education and training programs for the National Kidney Foundation, all kinds of uh, specific organizations that look at learning, look at peer support and the aspects of kidney care that are exciting. She's also on faculty at Duke of the Behavior Science and Social Science Department. And then Clint is someone who we met through our work. He was one of our earliest champions and our first customer. Uh, he ran operations for a massive region in South Carolina. Now he's come on board to support his old account to show us how it's done to be that inside information. And he's just fantastic and incredibly Passionate. So our team certainly knows how to take the product that's already been used and deployed and tested and take it to where it needs to go and then think about that roadmap more holistically across indications. Uh, I'll pause there, but uh, obviously have to answer any questions. And here's just kind of an idea of what we can chat about if it happens to be top of mind. Um, well, Tim, uh, thank you for your service. Um, Thanks, Amit. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I worry a little bit about the VR side of it, where we have seen VR 
make waves and then go back and then make waves and then go back. It hasn't achieved enough adoption. Uh, the use case that I've seen most often in healthcare is for surgeries, um, helping the doctors basically plan a surgery. That has some adoption, a little bit of medical education. I'm wondering how you're thinking about it. Absolutely, I appreciate the question. Uh, it's certainly a question we think about often. I think your surgery point is an important one. When I think about the two intersecting lines, and I'll share a slide here in a second to help articulate this, but I agree that in surgery, it's a fantastic use case where we have seen the benefit of existing off-the-shelf technologies, virtual reality technologies that are able to do things that are a minimum requirement for things like usability, feasibility of the patient population, the frontline provider population, but also are, there's already a high willingness to pay. So we're not waiting on consumer adoption. We, you know, at this point, we've waited long enough. Now we're at a point where we feel confident with off-the-shelf solutions to deliver what we need. And I think surgery is one example where we've seen what can be done and the outcomes that come along with it. But then when I think about what hasn't been done, it's, it's patient care. A lot of these solutions have not made their way commercially into patient markets. And then with the other intersecting theme of where in the patient side are we seeing investments and opportunities to find commercially viable ROI? It's in kidney care in particular. So just to wrap up here very quickly, this is some of the market trends that we, we think about. And on the top, top row, you see kidney care, you see the, the size of mega rounds, especially in value-based care, where deals have been done very recently. We see MA, uh, the continual expansion from uh, ESRD, that being kidney failure upstream into earlier stage kidney disease, how can we manage more patients? The astonishing thing about kidney care is there's only about less than 600,000 patients on dialysis today, but 37 million people have kidney disease. So we know there's a massive population moving towards needing to be managed and slow down the progression. So where can we produce VR insights, VR captured insights, uniquely suited to VR that then fuel this growth? And on the flip side, I think your point on Surgery, for one example, we have an example here. We have education, simulation, uh, enterprise, and then pain management. We know that VR is investable. Not all of these things require CPT codes to an earlier point, uh, thankfully, but they are generating real revenue in terms of enterprise sale into the into uh, healthcare organizations. Tim, I just have one question for you. Um, 80% of the dialysis market is controlled by DeVita or Fresnius in the US. Your company, to a certain extent, is banking on contracts, and you've you know started to penetrate Fresnius. But what happens if one or both providers decide we're not interested in this technology? Yeah, I think that is always a risk. I think the way that we manage that risk is working with them for years at this point, and understanding what the ROI is and what our solution is uniquely capable of, of solving. And I, I think that fear was probably more exacerbated coming out of the phase one where we were looking at that first initial contract to get signed. Since then, since we've added a number of states and have more coming online, I think more and more buy-in, like grassroots physicians seeing the benefit of VR compared to say YouTube, compared to handouts, compared to training centers and expensive deployments of, of brick and mortar services, that question is subsiding. Um, so it's always a risk. I mean, it's part of the reason why we develop multiple customer groups and segments and why we too see the, the benefit of moving upstream and why we too see other indications and broad applicability, say with 80% product overlap for what we're doing and other indications. But it's always a real risk, especially when you're in a market that has um, such a duopoly. I have a question. So, so um, I mean, it's a good idea to use VR for you know patient education activation, you know, to the kind of the counterpart of a missed question, what if the VEDAs decide to invest in VR on their own because they already have 80% of the market? You know, what what would you, how, how do you stay ahead? You know, what's the kind of, like, how, how do you protect the competitive advantage of, of your technology compared to others that might have way more resources they can pour in to develop this? Absolutely, I appreciate the question. So I, I when we think about that idea of someone like a large dialysis company thinking about doing this themselves. We look at what they've done. We look at what they've done in education. We look at what they've done in virtual reality, perhaps outside of us. Um, and that's a good benchmark. I think it helps also working so closely with them that we get to see how they think about solving those challenges and the types of resources they bring to the table. We also get to see where they may not 
make the mark, where they may not be able to figure out the parts that we do a lot better. Um, and I think that differentiation, knowing that the ROI on our existing solution far outweighs their need for investment is where it gets pretty interesting. And I can say that confidently after years working and partnering with those customers. Um, but I also think I acknowledge that, of course, they have capital resources, but um, I think that's just a, the real the real point here to make is it's a challenge for them to stand up these businesses and novel technologies that are not easy to do, especially when we think about our framework for how we develop solutions and that it is novel to create the content, identify the clinical need, identify when in their workflow and where in their curriculum VR makes sense. Um, and it is not just a put everything on VR because that's really a recipe for uh, increased spend without getting really the, the ROI they're looking for. So hopefully that addresses the question, but I think it comes down to big company has a tough time standing up a new business and how to actually apply it. Hey, Tim, really great to see you again. Um, just a quick question on um, your kind of expansion strategy in your five states that you already have. I know you have partnerships for um, as channels to get to customers. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of your expansion strategy? And why, particularly just within the five states and not other states? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Good to see you. Uh, I, I think two, two areas I want to highlight in the expansion strategy. One, existing the five states you mentioned. I think it's more important for us to invest resources in making sure the five states are done right and that we understand expansion within those states, especially where uh, those states represent different geographic swaths, patient populations. We're talking South Carolina, Massachusetts, Illinois, California, Mississippi. I think that's a, that's a great representation for an initial cohort. And the, the discussion back and forth is, we wanna make sure we know that this kit, when your frontline team has access to it in the clinics, in the homes, or those educators I mentioned, that they're confident they know how to use it, that we understand how to support them. I think that's an important point. So for that reason, we're very deliberate about ensuring that we're doing a great job in these first five states before we say double or, or set a milestone that gets us over our skis. Uh, the other piece is, the expanding upstream piece. I mentioned the practices. I think practices control a lot of the equation right now when we think about the future. I mentioned how few patients are on dialysis versus the large number who are earlier being managed. That's where we want to get to because if we get there first, not only can we help potentially slow progression, reduce cost, but we can get patients on the right therapy sooner, faster, and optimal treatments first, which is the focus. So in that side of the strategy, I think it's important that we make sure the tools we use are applicable enough to patients on, say, early stage CKD versus CKD 4 or 5, or those with diabetes. That's where we want to spend time on the product side. And I think there's, there's definitely some unknowns there. We want to make sure we get right so that by the time we say this product is ready and here are the patients that can support, we can do that with confidence across, say, 3 million additional patients who are at similar stages in other areas of the country. So that, that's kind of a diversified strategy, one in the land that expand enterprise model, and the other really understand the, the practice deployment strategy and which partnerships feed into those relationships. Just a quick question. Did you guys do any comparative analysis with your own content in VR and non-VR to see how the anxiety states or the adoption states um, shifted? Um, and I'm just curious what those results were like. We did. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate the question. Uh, good to meet you. So we, we did as part of the usability feasibility study under, under the NSF. And so anxiety was reduced at, on average 20%. I'll come back to you. 20% is a number I have in my mind for YouTube. So we're able to take VR, put it into two dimensions, kind of strip it down, and serve it online uh, at lower, less effective on in terms of anxiety, and less effective in terms of overall interest in pursuing home therapy. So I thought that was Pretty interesting, and I think the, the number one problem we had to solve was exactly that one in 2018, 2017, when we were first kind of coming up with what is the right comparison? Because at the end of the day, we could talk about competition in terms of learning management, in terms of VR, um, value-based care. It's it's doing nothing, it's the status quo. It's why don't we just keep using handouts? They're free and there's a lot of them and it covers all the education. That's always going to be our greatest challenge. So this was, this was the comp and I appreciate the question, but certainly we saw much higher interest after the storytelling, and that comes back to our entire thesis and framework around matching the parts of the brain that light up when a patient is stressed, and how can we do that 
We can't do that effectively in two dimensions on YouTube, but we can do it when we fully immerse someone in the story in virtual reality. And how, how many patients were in that study? So in the NSF phase one, we, 82 patients was, was the, uh, the end. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Rashad. Thanks, everybody. Um, Vince, uh, Rizika, and Jordana. Yeah, so I am going to do the presentation. Let me get it all set. Uh, can you guys all see? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Vince Hardman. I am co-founder and CEO of Abstractive Health. So I want to talk to you first about a huge problem in healthcare. Today, there is too much data. Your patient chart has more data than a doctor, frankly, has a chance to read at all. And we expect our doctor to, in fact, do that. As a patient, if you've ever gone to the doctor recently, they will be spending more time hunched over the computer than with you. That is the reality of healthcare today. Study after study has shown that doctors spend two hours in front of a computer for every one hour of patient care. It's an awful feeling that your doctor just doesn't have time for you and your health. And on average, doctors only have three minutes to review your medical chart before a visit, and they're missing critical information and crucial follow-ups. Numerous studies have shown how problematic this is for health outcomes. And doctors could actually make more if they knew who you were. 125 billion more each year is lost in revenue. So there just hasn't been a good way to do that until now. So for Abstractive Health, we're helping doctors read and write their clinical notes faster through an automated summary of the patient chart using NLP and generative AI. We are the clip notes for healthcare. Our solution, so we take the hundreds of pages of medical notes into a few key sentences and our automated summary contains why the patient presented, the course of the past treatments, and any follow-ups. This is the info a doctor is looking for before a visit. Our value prop for doctors is that we save them time writing those summary notes. We improve patient outcomes, and we help them increase their revenue reimbursement. By identifying more diagnoses of patients, we can make them more money and provide more accurate medical care for their patients. So our product presents a summary to doctors through integration with their existing computer system. So in this screen, this is EPIC, um, an electronic health record system that we're integrated with New York Presbyterian. The doctors are able to understand quickly what is happening to their patient, and we alert them of the most important clinical metrics. Uh, it's HIPAA compliance, and our technology ensures only clinical terms that doctors wrote are used in our summary. Uh, we link back to the source notes in our summary so they can quickly understand where the info came from, and it's very, it makes it very explainable. We provide the context around the presentation. So we spun out of Cornell Tech last May. And since December, we've seen a huge increase in momentum in uh, our like website, our sales channels, um, just conversation because of ChatGPT. So a year ago, we would pitch this and people didn't understand what was generative AI, what was large language models. And overnight, people now get it. So in a startup, one thing you can't control is timing. And we're kind of on a wave of timing right now. So we are in the best position to bring NLP and transformers to doctors because we did research in this space for two years and we built it um, to be factual and more accurate for healthcare. So ChatGPT was not specifically designed for healthcare. It's not HIPAA compliant. You can't send your patient data to. Some doctors have messaged us uh, about them actually doing it, we have to tell them don't do that. Um, it's not trained on patient charts, so it's not built to summarize medical records. And one of our favorites we've heard is that it's way too chatty. So doctors, they already have to read too much info and ChatGPT is just too long of the pros that it outputs. 
how we're different is we've built our model. It's 97% accurate at identifying those clinical follow-ups. And it, our models are at state-of-the-art performance as large language models, as GPT, BART, BERT. Uh, we trained on 10 to 20,000 real patient charts. We have a patent filed for our method for summarizing the longitudinal aspect of a chart. And we've performed the clinical assessment demonstrating our automated summary and how it compares to a physician written one. And we now have uh, two pilots, one with New York Presbyterian and a second with the Department of Health of Abu Dhabi. And doctors will shortly be seeing our summaries immediately at real time and seeing uh, the patients in a high stress environment such as the emergency department like we're doing at uh, New York Presbyterian. Our go-to-market strategy for this vision is that we're selling to uh, large medical centers and also to primary care organizations. We're positioning first with a few medical centers such as New York Presbyterian and Abu Dhabi to showcase credibility for data acquisition and accelerating physician adoption. And with this strategy, we plan to implement our product at outpatient practices. Um, we're shooting for five at the end of this year. Uh, because our product has met stringent security standards and we've demonstrated efficacy in that those journals I mentioned, uh, we're able to command enterprise pricing. And so um, we've already demonstrated this through Abu Dhabi. We have a paid pilot with them for 100,000. And the market is huge for this problem um, for, with enterprise contracts and outpatient practices. In the US alone, there's 200,000 primary care physicians and there's 6,000 medical centers. And so the uh, market size is 5.4 billion from just the United States perspective. So a little bit of background on myself. I've been in healthcare 10 years. I started at Epic and then I did consulting for six with Accenture. Uh, I deeply understand healthcare. And then I went back to Cornell Tech and I met my co-founding team, uh, Giordana and Rithika. Rithika is a software engineer. She worked at IBM and then uh, did the research in NLP with me. And then we spun out from Cornell University through our research and part of their incubator program. I got like a pop-up from Google Drive. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in order to hit our milestones over the next 18 months, we're raising 1.2 million for our pre-seed round. Uh, this allows us to capture the five medical centers and 10 outpatient practices over the next 18 months. We've got verbal commitments for 788,000 right now. And so we have room for about 400 to 500,000 more for interested investors and investments in this round. And if you would like to learn more, I invite you to go to our website at Abstractive Health and happy to answer questions too. Have to always put up the QR code. It wouldn't be a, a presentation without the QR code. Thanks, Vin. Um, great presentation. Um, Thank obviously, you. A, a hot topic. Uh, I was on a panel last week with Microsoft and and the Vector Institute. I think Jeff Hinton got mentioned earlier in this conversation. And you know, so really bullish about um, different ways in which uh, generative um, is going to impact um, human health outcomes. Um, you know, I, I'm curious what your thoughts were at you know the Hims announcement of Microsoft with Epic. Um, and you know it's still early days, and I I totally acknowledge that this thing wasn't today. OpenAI's version wasn't built for medicine particularly, but I guess some of the questions I'm thinking about are how long will it take for them, or some of the other players that you mentioned, to become that, and then you know what strategic benefit does, and you worked at Epic, um, so you must, you'll have a sense of what this could look like if they, you know, it just goes across the board and. and they can sort of supersede the 20,000 records that you've trained on. So I was just curious how you think about that as an opportunity, as a threat, um, yeah, start there. Yeah, great question, Rick. Um, I'll try to keep this to three minutes. I could definitely make it a 10 minute exposition. I was at the HIMSS presentation also. We were, we had a booth and we um, exhibited there. We saw Microsoft and the uh, Epic announcement. Frankly, I think they're gonna do the like patient messaging and. Um, that aspect. They're not going to do it clinically oriented for about, my guess is two years. Um, they may get a clinic or two to jump in that wants the early advertisement. I 
frankly believe this from like a clinical aspect this is good to do on a startup level because it has a, an inherent risk to it i think it is not in epic's like best foray to put their name on it i mean that then will you'll ask the question about like how are you handling risk and all that which i'll get into next but i think it's best tuned for a startup and that, and i don't think you are going to see like microsoft and google jump into the like summarization of clinical notes they will do like the transcription and the ambient nlp but not go so as far as this um so and then i can let rithika talk about the like how we control for risk and what we're doing specifically um from preventing clinical diagnostic prediction yeah yeah so as um finn said like gpt GPT-4 is not HIPAA compliant. Um, and so we're currently undergoing, uh, work, we're working with Vanta, which is another startup to be HIPAA and SOC 2 compliant. Um, and we needed that priority even working with New York, Pre New York Presbyterian. So we'll be fully SOC 2 compliant uh, by the time we're launching there. Um, and so that risk, inherent risk with using pa real patient data, um, that's a real factor that these large companies have to deal with. Also, our models initially were trained on real patient data. We have a licensing agreement with Wild Cornell. Um, that licensing agreement took about two years to get. Um, so we're not even allowed to train our servers outside of the core service within Wild Cornell's GPUs. So there's a lot of risks, a lot of loopholes you have to jump through to be, be able to access real patient data and train your models on that and then to launch in a hospital. Um, so that kind of helps with that. So as, as we see advancements in like more private LLMs coming online, um, given the challenges that you know certain companies won't want Microsoft or OpenAI to have access to some of their sensitive information, how do you think about um, some of the other challenges that continue to emerge for some of these companies, which is you know server costs and, and the costs associated with building and developing? How do you manage that as a early stage startup? Yeah, so two is. Um... I wouldn't say it's server cost. It's just accessing GPU because like AWS has been a little like you have to really, really like have relations. Like we had nagged them all the time to get more GPU because they're hesitant from the blockchain usage of um, that took up all the GPU. So um, that's actually a company wide issue with AWS. We were just talking about <laughs> They're like they don't have GPUs. Like everyone is complaining that they don't have access to GPUs. And that's a real problem actually right now. Yeah, so that the first one. And the second one is there's only like ten to twenty thousand people in the US that like could actually build a transformer and that have done the research. So most of the like computer scientists out there, I mean that'll change in the next year. People will like take the time. Maybe Andrew Ng will put a good like um Coursera on how to build a transformer. But for now, um it's actually really hard to get a good NLP scientist. And so that's the second thing is that the, um, you're gonna see the, the price of these engineers if it hasn't already go up a bit um, for early stage startups. So they're gonna command quit. And then the, there's gonna be the software engineers that are just doing APIs to um, Azure for just nothing special about it, no fine tuning on it. And that's pretty like standard, but you don't have the background on like, um, improving them, going into the transformer, doing the fine tuning and understanding the whole mechanics of it and everything. There is a big learning curve difference. So that's a challenge that we're facing too. Just like hiring and bringing on people as we're gonna scale. And when, it was just a question about the technology. So can the technology go beyond the text? Oh, like for example, like imaging or oh, like, how does it incorporate like the the different component of healthcare needs, which is quite complex, and some of them be goes beyond just tax. So our yeah. current folk, yeah, you want to jump in on this? Rest of Sorry. <laughs> um, I was going to say right now we focus only on tax. It could be unstructured text. It could be text from like voice to text dictation. But right now the large language models are focused only on text. Vince, do you want to say what you were saying? Yeah, uh, most of the like core clinical data that we're seeing from building our summary and other like workflows in that manner are from the unstructured clinical notes and like progress notes consults discharge summaries we pull in like some lab and vitals and 
the demographics play a core component, but the labs and vitals actually is only a small component of like what is enhancing the model. It's really the unstructured text that's doing it. We've actually found that if we feed, um, like we, I've done research in the space of if you feed like an imaging data, like alongside the radiology report, um, you might want to do so if you want to do like a predictive thing, but we're not doing that. But from like just a summarization standpoint, it becomes too much noise and it, uh, like the model doesn't perform as well from like feeding it just straight up imaging data. So we looked, but it like, it's not like um, as aligned with what we're doing right now. Uh, Vince, uh, great to see you again. Um, wondering if you have done any user studies on the patient side. So obviously the tools used is for clinicians. Um, makes sense. That's where the money is. That's where the need is. But all of us are patients at the end of the day. And most of us cannot make sense of those clinical notes, right? I, I try to read them and I usually have to use Google to Google up a bunch of things. Um, would it make sense as a way of push and pull? Like, hey, here's a feature we provide. Your patients will now understand what the hell you're talking about. So the, to even uh, give you something you may not even realize, we had a doctor come to us. We didn't even think of this. They don't even know how to read other specialty notes. So we had one that says, like, this neurology, like, I'm a dermatologist. I don't know what they're writing about. Can you translate this for me in this language? So we have actually been looking at um, that, like, first, like, doctor-to-doctor -doctor translation and assistance in that manner. Because of what you mentioned, there's um, a business model more towards that. This, like, we would have the capability to do physician to patient. But kind of what was said at the beginning, like about um, people paying and business models and all that, like we um, we haven't like found as many patients that have been frankly um, willing, like in our conversations, that it's a challenge, like that they would desire it, but we don't know the best path for a business model in that manner. So we're open to it, but we just don't know how to get there from like that perspective. There, there was a fun study done, um, you know, and. I wouldn't. Even, I would hesitate to call it a study, but it was. Uh, I think it was uh, University of California, San Diego, or I can't remember who did it. Uh, it was Reddit. Uh, you know, 195 questions, yeah. verified clinicians, um, and then they had. Um, I think it was ChatGPT basically answer the same questions. And what they demonstrated through independent human testers was that the machine was outperforming. I think somewhere in the order of four x from a uh, an empathy score. Um, and, you know, when we think about keyboard liberation and all the things that, I mean, all these things are beneficial to the doctor, I always thought in the 1.0 thinking of this that, well, that'll just open up more physician time to be more empathetic. And, you know, we know those things can have huge health outcome and benefits. Um, what's crazy, and, and this goes back to Ahmed's point, is that it seems like the machines are doing a better job on the empathy scoring as well, if we take this study for, you know, to, to have uh, some validity. Yeah, like uh, one of the writers of that paper actually is in one of my work groups for um, AMIA. So we were mentioning that last week and he was just surprised at how much it exploded exactly what you're mentioning on uh, how ChatGPT can do these sort of aspects that we really didn't even consider from an AI level. Like 12 to 24 months ago, people were considering AI as more just like analytical aspect, but now people are very much now familiar. It can do like dolly and mid journey aspects and um our designer giordana like most of our blog articles now <laughs> we like she does not have the time to build out some of our images so mid journey on google does a great job for um helping us build out these so yeah totally creativity is a big aspect of what large language models can do is where i was going with that Vince, it took you guys two years to get the deal with Cornell. And so I understand that as being a technical, I mean, a significant hurdle for other companies for a competition. But is there a true technical mode around the LLM if someone else, you know, gets a large data set, however, whomever, um, besides sort of the things that you explained of obviously end up engineers getting more difficult to hire, et cetera, et cetera. But over time that commoditizes. So is, is there a technical mode around what you guys are doing um, besides the data? So we've started to build up our like own intellectual property and we've got a patent, but from just like 
software and technical and just IP. Um, it's a fast moving environment. So um, we would be in that space. So somewhat technical, but uh, I would put it at like eight, 12 to 18, 24, like within that 18 months, like that there could be a, a true competitor like like us in the space that could come and get the data and build it. So that's why we're very much attempting to grow fast and get into a lot of places quickly. Uh, just one last question, and I noticed that certainly Trez here, so I'll also uh, lend my time, some of my time to him as well, but kind of shifting gears a little bit. I know that you guys kind of sell into big medical centers, and traditionally that has been a long sales cycle usually. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're planning either to mitigate that or kind of the expansion in terms of network um, into your like strategy in the future? Yeah, so uh, we've sped up everything of the sales cycle that's uh, implementation oriented. So like we have a smart on fire app, we have um, SOC 2 compliant. Like, so we're making ourselves very much a, you can turn us on from an enterprise standpoint. Uh, that said, it'll probably still take nine months to get into a large health system because of like compliance, legal, um, the, the whole process. And that's what we're seeing. So it'll take nine months in that aspect from the other sales cycle we're going towards is the outpatient practices. They're much faster. They have like a two to three months that you can um, get them up and start using your product. So uh, we view that the large medical centers are like an essential component of our sales process because they have large contracts. They um, like once you land one, they also don't churn. They have like great lifetime value in that manner. Uh, so. But we, we really recognize that. And we also have like strong connections in like our advisors and we're starting to see uh, getting in the door in like a decent number of medical centers too in our sales pipeline. And we're starting to track it all in Salesforce and Giordana has been doing a great job with that. Great, thanks Vince. Awesome, thanks Vince. Thank you all. Thanks to all the judges and all the startups who presented today. If anyone from the audience is interested in connecting to startups, you can send me an email um, at hello at healthtechinvestors.com. Samitra, um, I would like you to give some thoughts on trends in healthcare and in VC, you're saying. Um, and thanks for coming on last minute. Hey, guys. I want to be mindful, Rashad. How much time, how much time do you want to spend? What do you recommend? Um, you know, I, I personally, I love listening your, to your insights and thoughts, but I think, uh, let's keep it to under 10 minutes. You know, I can definitely keep it tight. Um, and I'll keep it, I think relevant as a capstone. Let me start by saying Rashad, awesome event and very impressive work that you've done bringing the HDI community together. Uh, I will toss on two themes that I think will be a good capstone for the event today. Uh, the first is that I think that this Sorry, is- Sorry, Samitra, awesome. could you also introduce yourself? I realize oh, I yeah. know you, but others might not. <laughs> hey guys, good to see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, I'm Samitra, uh, physician, VC. I started a fund uh, with my co-GP Brandon called Med Mountain Ventures, early seed, uh, all parts healthcare life science. We do this technical seed micro fund model. Um, I know Andy and Kristen incredibly well. I think I was first or early investor in um, good to see Joa here as well. Uh, you know, Lena's on the board with me. Amit and Sharon are some of my favorite people, and I'm just so excited to see so many people all in one place. Um, you know, I think that the two themes that really summarize today are this is a dope time to invest in healthcare. Valuations are down. Technology is awesome. Regulatory changes have created a lot of chaos. I think that this is the best time for incredibly deep expert investors to do really well in healthcare and to do well for society by supporting a lot of innovative tech. I think we saw that today. I thought all the companies today were really fascinating and awesome. And the second point I'll toss out is that, especially I'm targeting this for the audience of a lot of like physician VC, like physician investors who are learning to invest. You know, healthcare is definitely a team sport. Healthcare innovation is a team sport for all the companies that we saw today. They touch on so many different domains. It's very hard for one person 
on their own to have domain expertise in every single thing that's relevant to understand these companies. And it makes sense for really effective groups of investors to diversify across different domains. When we bring people onto our team, we try to make sure they're sort of like, you know, radically different and somewhat, somewhat oblique to like everyone else on the team. Whenever I co-invest in deals, I love doing it with funds who think very differently from how I think. And when I look at founding teams, I really love the fact that you get people from very different domains. So again, targeted for the audience who are a lot of physicians who are starting out in their investing career, I'm sure that there were a lot of things that you saw and you were like, you know, totally understand this. This is legit. You know, I'm skeptical of that. There are probably a lot of things that you heard and you're like, you know, I don't really have a framework for understanding this. What I toss out is it's totally cool. Lean into the things you really understand. Find people who are really good at all those other things you don't. Talk to them and learn from them. I think that that's how I have built a lot of my friendships with my people who I invest with regularly. It's certainly been a big part of our process when we've been investing. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, Somitra. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. The video will be out over the weekend, and I'll send everyone an email. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone.